be a cool camp, but um, please get your um, applications in so that we know and can plan for it. Well, this morning, um, I'm going to be, for possibly the first time in my life, politically correct. The first time. I am going to say today, Happy Birthing Persons Day. Oh, you all look stunned. Happy Mother's Day. Day. That's not politically correct, Karen. That's why I said I was going to be politically correct for the first time and probably the last time. Because we have people wanting to change Happy Mother's Day to Happy Person's Birthing Day. Now doesn't quite have the same sound or quite the same thing as Mother's Day, does it? And it makes you wonder, well, why touch something that is, is right? It's, you know, I won't tell you what they call Father's Day. I'm, I'm leaving that one, but it's whether I choose to be politically correct on that day is another question, but... Oh, you believe in equality, do you? Well, I'll keep that in mind. But the idea is that, you know, they want people to feel all-inclusive except the were those who want to be mothers. And I'm thinking today as Mother's Day, how do you describe a mother? How do you describe a mother? And I came across this article and I'm going to read it to you because often mothers feel unappreciated and not valued in what they do and yet here is an article that says a lawyer met a housewife at a function and asked her what she did. The housewife replied, I'm socialising two homo sapiens in the dominant values of the Judeo-Christian tradition in order that they might be instruments for the transformation of the social order in the teleologically prescribed utopia inherent in the Escalon. Then she added, and what do you do? The lawyer answered, uh, I'm just a lawyer. And that's one of the many reasons we honour mothers today, because only a mother could make a lawyer speechless. But I thought that was a good summary of what a woman, of what a mother does. So if you ever ask what do you do, keep that in mind. But this morning I want us to look at Hannah, the prayer warrior. And I want us to understand that in such times as this in which we're living, we have so many things that are happening, uh, so many uh, changes that are taking place. And uh, we just get to the point sometimes where we wonder what can we do? And my thought that I want us to understand today is prayer. We don't place much value on prayer. And when we do pray, it's usually when we're in trouble or we've run out of options or we can't work things out, then we say, oh, I better pray. And yet prayer is important. It's the way in which we connect with God and God chooses to answer. And particularly as mothers and particularly as grandmothers, one of the best things we can do and the most important things we can do is pray for our children and our grandchildren. We can take them before the throne of grace. Now in our study in 1 Samuel 1, we see the difficulty that this mother was undergoing. Well, she wasn't a mother yet, but... We see all the pressures and tensions that come out in a home in trying to raise children. Everything's changing quickly. And you know, it's difficult. And I have to smile. Well, maybe you can do better. But when our politicians are asked to define what is a woman, they can't tell you. They tell you it's complex, it's complicated. Now maybe this morning, what is a woman? Yeah, 
It's not that hard. But yet our leaders can't define what a woman is. Just blows you away. And the idea is to blur the genders, to be inclusive of anyone who decides they want to be either male or female. They can be whatever you want. It's being pushed, it's being taught in our schools as being natural and normal. And our children and grandchildren are being exposed to all of this kind of thinking. And in such times, what can we do? Well, we pray. And you might be thinking, well, prayer doesn't change much. What's going to change? Well, you will change to start with because you're seeking God's intervention to take control over something that you cannot. We cannot be everywhere that our children are or our grandchildren. And so we need to see the importance of prayer. It works. It's answered. And one commentator points this out. The basic premise in prayer, the size of your God determines the size of your prayer request. The size of your prayer request determines the size of your answers. In other words, how big is your God? What are you going to ask him? And that will determine the answers that you get. I want us to see Hannah as a prayer warrior. Someone who knew the size and the power of her God and had persistence to get God to answer her prayer. I hope that this may be encouragement to mothers but also dads and to grandparents. We can uphold our children and grandchildren every day before the Lord. We can do it. As we open our Bibles and go to 1 Samuel, we find the the story here, and you can have a look at that, the passage there. But the problem is brought out in verses 1 to 5. And in this passage, we are introduced to a family. There's a husband, and he has two wives. One was able to have children, and one wasn't able to and so things didn't go too well in this family I have no doubt there was a lot of jealousy and a lot of tension between the family because there was a problem existed one was able to have children one wasn't now the husband Elkanah he wasn't such a bad bloke he appears to be a good provider he appears to be a godly man And Hannah had been his first wife, but because she was unable to conceive and have children, he took another woman as his wife and named her Paniah. Now, if you're the first wife, you can only imagine the disappointment, especially when it seems that this new wife was able to have children without a problem. You would feel heartbroken, broken, You were part of a family, but none of the children were yours. And the ache to have children would have only deepened over time. And then you add to this heartache when you've got the second wife throwing it in your face every opportunity that she had to let you know. And in verse 5, we see the reason why Hannah was unable to conceive, because the Lord had shut up her womb. And that's something that we all need to understand. That God is the one that opens and shuts the wombs and he's the one who gives children to people. Hannah was, she wanted children but was unable. This was something that was out of her control at this time. And so she had a difficult time in the family possibly questioning her value, questioning or what sort of a a woman am I because I can't have children, trying to understand what am I here for? And I'm sure there are many women in today's society who could identify with Hannah's desire to have children. But for some reason, they're not able to. Hannah wanted the situation to change, but this was something that was out of her control. 
In verses 6 and 7 we see the provocation. Penai would tease Hannah and upset her because the Lord had made her unable to have children. This happened every year when they went up to the house of the Lord at Shiloh. Penai would upset Hannah until Hannah would cry and not eat anything. The husband Elkanah would say to her, Hannah, why are you crying? Why won't you eat? Why are you sad? Don't I mean more to you than ten sons? So the family would go up to the temple every year. It should have been a time of joy and fun. But we've got the second wife, Paniah, taking every opportunity to taunt and provoke Hannah because of her inability to have children. All of this had the effect of affecting Hannah very deeply. The attacks were intense, they were personal, and they were persistent. You know, when you put under that pressure and tension every time, it will break you. And so Hannah, it broke her. I believe she was prone to panic attacks, it affected her health and her ability to eat. Remembering this wasn't just a once-off that it happened, it was done on a regular basis. Our text says year after year, it was rubbed into her face. Now, if you're the husband, what do you do in this situation? And this is something that husbands, you better pay attention to. Because Elkanah, well, I don't think he understood what she was going through because he asked her four questions and it shows his inability to deal with the situation. He says, Hannah, why aren't you crying? Why are you crying? You know, <laughs> as if he didn't already know why she was crying. She was unable to have children. Why don't you eat? He would have understood why she wasn't able to eat. Why are you so downhearted? Meaning he didn't understand the tension, or if he did, he cut it out, that was happening between his two wives. And the last one, to rub it right in, he says, don't I mean more to you than ten sons? Very sensitive to how she's feeling. Now, he's telling Hannah, look, you've got no reason to be sad, you've got me. That's all you need. So in other words, stop your crying. You've got me. I'm better than anything else, so be happy. Now that didn't go down too well. It just added to the emotional turmoil she's feeling. He just increased the pain and was telling her, you've got no right to feel sad or unhappy about things that are happening to you. Now in defence, it's a difficult task for men to relate to their wives on an emotional level. When wives talk about a problem, what do we men want to do? What are we hardwired to do? If there's a problem, what do we do? Fix it, don't we? When it comes to women, can you fix them? If you're told the problem and you try to fix it, have you ever been told, that's not what I want? Why is that so? They speak a different language. They speak a different language. Does that mean that we as men are not connected to that language? Well, why is it that we struggle in these areas? If you're clear and it's a different language, how do you fix the problem? You see, we tend to look for a solution. And of course, when we can't find a solution and we can't fix it, as men we feel inadequate. We feel as though we have failed because we can't connect. 
Often, women just want to be listened to without necessarily being needed to have anything fixed. Often, it's just, listen to me. That's all. They don't want to be fixed. They just want to be reassured, reaffirmed. And so in our life, we will have difficulties. And there'll always be people who will challenge our faith, challenge where we're at. And sometimes it can be difficult, even amongst husbands and wives. They're not enjoyable times, but we can learn from them. And particularly in this situation with the two wives, I don't know, the husband seemed to not be aware of what was going on, the tension between them, but to be able to deal with the innuendos and the insults that they're not taken to heart. These two women's names are reflective of their natures. What does Hannah mean? We've got a Hannah. What does Hannah mean? Her name means woman of grace. And that describes how she dealt with the difficulties she faced in life. Now, Paniah's name means venomous. And she lived up to her name in the way that she treated Hannah. But we can see the provocation. There are many situations in life that will provoke one another, and particularly in relationships between husbands and wives and families. It can be children, it can be grandparents, it can be anyone that can provoke one another. And so sometimes in our families, they can be very dysfunctional. And we wonder why. We see the determination that was exhibited in verses 9 through 16. Why did God, or why does God want us to pray? Why does God want us to pray? What's the point? Yeah, but does he really need prayer to do that? I mean, couldn't he just click his fingers and make things happen? Couldn't he just do something without wanting us to be involved? So why pray? Particularly if God knows what we need and when we need it and how we need it, why pray? God doesn't need us to pray, but he wants us to pray. And it's through our prayers that he accomplishes his purposes. Now that doesn't mean I can go to God and ask him for you know, my list, the big list, and expect that he's going to answer it exactly the way I want it. But he does give me something better than what I want. It means that when we pray, we're asking God to participate in our lives to fulfill his purposes for us and also the world in which we live. And this is why Hannah went to prayer. Once after they'd eaten their meal in Shiloh, Hannah got up. Now Eli the priest was sitting on a chair near the entrance to the Lord's house. Hannah was so sad that she cried and prayed to the Lord. Things had not got better for Hannah over time. She had reached a breaking point. And the actual original brings out she was in bitterness of soul. She prayed to the Lord and wept in anguish. And really what it's saying is Hannah reached breaking point. She couldn't take it anymore. All the shame because she couldn't have children. In those days there was a, a stigma if you couldn't have children, there was something wrong with you or God was punishing you. There was a lack of fulfilment. There was the taunting 
by the other women, the despair of watching other women playing with the children. It had reached a point in her life where she couldn't take it anymore. So she offered her broken heart to God in prayer. It was a genuine, heartfelt prayer. Even though there was bitterness, she hadn't given up. She poured out her heart to God, sharing how she felt. She shared her hopes, her dreams and her desires. And the reason she did it was because she knew that only God could meet her deepest need and solve her personal situation. Now let's face it, it wasn't the best place in her life to find herself at this time. But you know what? She was right where she needed to be. She was broken before the Lord. She didn't seek any other person. She sought the Lord. And sometimes in our families, sometimes in life, the trials and difficulties um, are unpleasant. They're not things that you welcome. They're not things that you want. But they happen. And every one of us sitting here has been there at some point in our lives. There are things that we haven't got control over. There were things that there is no option A, B or C. There's nothing we can do. But there is one thing as Christians we can do and that's go to the one who does have control over all things. Hannah found a place of refuge, a place where she could go and pour out her feelings, pour out her frustrations and anger, knowing she could draw strength from her time with the Lord. She gave him her burdens and he was able to carry them. Now when we don't take them to the Lord, when we don't trust the Lord with them, the only alternative that we have is to carry them ourselves. And they're burdens that we're not meant to carry. Because when we start doing things our way, in our own strength, we become more frustrated and we become bitter the longer that we hang on to things and believe that we have to solve them ourselves. We're not prepared to trust God or go to him in prayer or seek his advice or seek for a solution. We tend to want to say, I don't need God, I can handle this, let me do it. And the more that we try, the more frustrated we become because we haven't got a solution. The promise, she made a promise saying, Lord all powerful, see how sad I am. Remember me and don't forget me. If you'll give me a son, I'll give him back to you all his life and no one will ever cut his hair with a razor. Two things about Hannah's prayer. It involves submission and it involves sacrifice. She approached God with a request as his handmaiden, meaning she was willing to do whatever he wanted her to do. Now I don't think this is the first time that she has prayed to the Lord but it's probably the first time she had handed everything over into his hands. She'd reached that point where she was ready to relinquish control of her life. And so often we pray to God but we don't give him everything. We don't hand over everything to him. As the scriptures tell us, casting all your care upon him for he careth for you. Now that's casting all our burdens onto him. And when we cast our burdens, it means you take that burden, those things you're carrying, and you throw them away from yourself to somebody else. And in this case, the scriptures are saying, we're taking those burdens, those things that we have no control over, and we're throwing them to the Lord. We're saying, they're not mine anymore, they're yours. They belong to him. And that's what we do. That's what we're supposed to do. Casting our burdens on him because we know he cares for us. The problem is, do we trust him enough? Do we really want him to have 
all those burdens. Because what we tend to do is, if we don't get an answer straight away, what do we do? We take it back. If God doesn't answer me straight away, then we take that problem back. We take that burden back. And once again, it becomes our burden. And yet we've just prayed. I've thrown this burden. I've thrown this care. I've thrown this prayer to you. It's yours. And then we take it back. And we wonder why we're sad and we're broken. It means we have lack of trust that God will do what he says. Or we have lack of trust that God's going to do anything. And that's why we take it back. Our text says she was willing to sacrifice or to give back what she was asking to the Lord if he granted her her prayer. If you give me a son, Lord, I'll give him back to you. Wow. It appears, well, maybe she's bargaining with the Lord, but I don't think so. I think she came to the place where she realized in her life the children are a gift from the Lord. They belong to him and they're his to be able to do whatever he wants. As parents, we're given the privilege of raising and bringing these young lives up for him to use. They belong to him. Every child is a gift given by God to us. He lets us have the privilege, if you like, of raising them of bringing them up, of preparing them to serve him. And then he will call and he'll want them back. Now that might be hard for a lot of people to understand, but that's a biblical fact. It's the, the Lord who gives us children as a gift. She had been barren for many years and she'd been trying to deal with this problem and her position and she realized the children are a gift for parents. They're given and loaned out to us for a while. And then they're to be used by the Lord in whatever way he seems fit. And that's a principle that's hard for us to understand sometimes. We think they're mine. They're my kids. They're my children. And yet God has his claim upon them. As a parent, they're only loaned to us. It can be a short time. It can be a long time. But we're to treasure them, but we're also to accept the responsibility. We've been given the opportunity to train them. And then when we've trained them to say, Lord, take them and use them in whatever way you want. And hopefully we've done a good job so that he can use them. And we know that God answered Hannah's prayers. He provided her with a boy. She called him Samuel, who God greatly used to bring a whole nation unto himself. And where did this start with? A godly woman who wanted a child, and she gave him back to God. And God used him. How might God use your children you thought about that? They can change a nation. They can change a community. You never know what God has got in mind for our children. That's why they're loaned. But we have the privilege of being able to raise them to develop their character. But Hannah's promise was there. It involved sacrifice. It involved submission. The perseverance. While Hannah kept praying, Eli watched her mouth. He was praying in her heart, so her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Eli thought she was drunk. He said to her, stop getting drunk. Throw away your wine. Hannah answered, no, sir, I have not drunk any wine or beer. I'm deeply troubled, woman. I'm telling the Lord about all my problems. Don't think I'm an evil woman. I've been praying because I have many troubles and I'm very sad. 
Now, I will give Eli his due. He was an old man and he was deaf. So he was lip reading or trying to lip read and didn't do a very good job. But our text shows Hannah's perseverance. She continued in prayer and she was focused on her prayer. And it must have been hard for her to remain focused when these accusations from Eli the priest, someone who should have known better because people were supposed to come to the temple to pray and worship God. And here she is being put down by someone who should have known better. Now, when you think about it, here is this woman pleading her case to God and someone comes along and infers and accuses and implies that she's drunk with wine. Somebody who doesn't understand what she's going through, someone who cannot relate to her situation, someone who misunderstands everything she does or says. And I wonder how many people have been in that situation, how many mothers have often felt that way. They're carrying a burden, they're misunderstood. They feel exactly what Hannah's feeling. When other people don't appreciate your problem, when they seek to hinder you from going to the Lord and seeking his face, it's very difficult to remain focused, to keep your determination to do what you started out to do, rather than allowing yourself to be distracted by other people and other things. Hannah was persistent in her prayers and while others didn't understand her problems, she understood God does. He sees what's happening, he cares about what's happening and he knows what I need. So she responds to the barb of Eli by reminding him she's praying to God because of her sadness and her problems. She's pouring out her heart to God. She has laid it bare. She has not held anything back. And there are many times that people will hinder us from going to God in prayer. And there are many things that will do that. There can be stress. There can be concern for the things of the world. There can be anxiety. There can be physical, mental and emotional weariness and busyness. All of these things are distractions to stop us from going to God in prayer. When we don't feel like praying, it's a distraction. But like Hannah, we're to persevere. In other words, find a place and be committed to praying to God each day. Hannah was open towards God. She was a prayer warrior. In other words, she held nothing back and she knew the source of her strength was to be found in God alone. In the delight expressed, she became a mother. Or she was going to be a mother. But, you know, as we think about today, you know, it's an awesome responsibility and it's a great gift that we're given to become mothers and fathers. When you think about it, it's rather overwhelming we're given a precious young life to mould, to shape and direct. And you know what? In my experience, it doesn't come with an owner's manual with everything that you need to do. Maybe I'm wrong, but when you had your children, did it come with an owner's manual telling you the make and model and the year and what you need to do to fix it and make sure that it gets the best that it can? I haven't found one. I found the word of God helps me most, but I didn't get a manual that says, if you do this, this, this and this, and you do this, this and this and this, then you'll get your perfect child. It doesn't come with an owner's manual. It doesn't come. It doesn't come with everything to tell you what you need to know and do. Sometimes I think that's what we want. But you know what, each model, each child is different. They have their own different personalities. They're not identical. They don't all have the same characteristics. 
They're unique individuals. That's why they're called gifts. And when you're given a gift, you can't give that gift back and say, I don't like that one. Give me another one. Now, according to Jewish tradition, Levi priest, and this is what Hannah did, she promised her future son to God as a priest. And the depths of her commitment, she committed her boy to a Nazarite vow. And so a Levite priest would serve to the age of 50. And when they prayed the Nazarite vow, it lasted for a limited time. But Hannah's commitment went more than just for a limited time. Her vow was for all the days of his life that he would serve God. Now, it's such an extreme promise for a son she's not yet been given. This is what she's promising. Now, the difficult question is, mothers, how much do you trust God? Do you trust him enough? To give him your children? If not, the next question is why not? Hannah trusted God completely with her son, and so we can too. You may say, I think that's a high price to pay to give my son or daughter to serve God. And you know what? You're right. It is a high price to pay. But it was the price that God paid to give his only son to the world. Are you willing to give your son or your daughter to him? And I guess getting right down to it, the nitty gritty as, children, as parents, can we trust God with our children? Can we trust God with our children? Can we trust God with our own lives? Can you lead your children to serve God? And you can if you serve God yourself. Can you lead your children to worship God? And you can if you worship him. Can you lead your children to become mighty men and women of God who will use to touch the lives of other people? Yes, you can. Because you're allowing yourself to be an influence that touches the lives of people around you. And that's the challenge. Can I trust God with my children? And the answer should be yes, because God can be in places where I cannot be with my children. Very early in our married life, and particularly when they got to teenagers, you know, you're waiting for your children to come home. You don't know where they are or what they're up to. But you know what? We found that we could trust God with our children. He could be where we're not. He could see what they're doing and he was the one that could protect them. All we had to do was trust him. And that's letting go. Because God can do things that you and I cannot. He has plans for each one of our children. The petition, whoops. I've gone too far. The petition. There we have. Eli answered, Go, I wish you well. May the God of Israel give you what you ask of him. Hannah said, May I always please you. When she left and ate something, she was not sad anymore. I guess what I'm saying in the text here is she gave everything to God. She didn't hold back. She didn't try to handle things herself. And after she had spent time with God in prayer, she went away in peace. There was nothing left for her to give. It was all out. And I'm reminded of Philippians 4, 6 and 7. Does anyone remember what that says? Sim simply says this, Do not be anxious about anything. Instead, in every situation, through prayer and petition with thanksgiving, tell your request to God. And then the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. It's a scriptural principle. But you have to leave it with him. Hannah walked away a changed woman. 
She wasn't sad anymore. Her life began to change. Now note, she prayed, but she didn't get the sun straight away. It wasn't a direct answer to prayer, but she changed. And she changed because of a prayer. As Christians, we have not been promised a life of ease. We will have our share of difficulties in life, but we can know and we can have the peace of God to give him our burdens and leave them with him knowing he'll give us whatever we need to get through these difficult times, just as Hannah did. We see the praise. Early the next morning, Elkanah's family got up, worshipped the Lord. Then they went back home to Ramah. Elkanah had sexual relations with his wife Hannah and the Lord remembered her. So Hannah became pregnant and in time she gave birth to a son. She named him Samuel saying, his name is Samuel because I asked the Lord for him. Prayer changed her mind, changed her outlook and God heard. God answered prayer. He provided her with peace and security and because of this her faith grew and she was able to worship God. God gave her the desire of her heart. She conceived and became pregnant, had a son and if you like, all his life, Samuel was both an answer to prayer and he was a great man of prayer. Why? Because of the influence of his mother. He saw it firsthand. He became a person of prayer because of Hannah's influence. The preparation. Every year, Elkanah went with his family to Shiloh to offer sacrifices to keep the promise he made to God. But one time Hannah did not go with him. She told him, when the boy is old enough to eat solid food, I'll take him to Shiloh. Then I'll give him to the Lord. He'll always live there. Elkanah, Hannah's husband, said to her, do what you think is best. You may stay home until the boy is old enough to eat. May the Lord do what you have said. So Hannah stayed at home to nurse her son until he was old enough to eat. In this time, Hannah was preparing Samuel for service in the temple under Levi. I have no doubt she treasured this time that she had before she gave her son back to the Lord to prepare him for greater service for the Lord. But she prepared him. And then lastly we have the presentation. When Samuel was old enough to eat, Hannah took him to the house of the Lord at Shiloh along with a three-year-old bull, one half bushel of flour and a leather bag filled with wine. And they killed the bull for the sacrifice. Hannah brought Samuel to Eli. She said to Eli, as surely as you live, sir, I am the same woman who stood near you praying to the Lord. I prayed for this child and the Lord answered my prayer and gave him to me. Now I give him back to the Lord. He'll belong to the Lord all his life and he worshiped the Lord there. So here we have a mother keeping her vow. She presents Samuel in service to the Lord. And her testimony is simple. I asked the Lord for a son and he gave me one. And now I'm giving him back to the Lord to serve the Lord all his life. And then you know what the text says? Samuel as a young boy fell down and worshipped the Lord there and then. He was only a young boy between the ages of three and, or five. And so this is what he did. Hannah honoured the Lord with a prayer and she returned him to use. How did Samuel, as a young child, learn to worship God? And there's only one reason, through the example of his mother, Hannah. As parents, we live in uncertain times. We want our children to follow the Lord, but it's becoming more and more difficult with the influence the world is exerting upon us. And we ask, what should we do? And there's only one word, pray. As parents and as mothers today, we're given a wonderful privilege and responsibility in raising our children who belong to the Lord, not to us. 
where to raise them to know him and love him. And regardless of how much effort we put into teaching and training our children, without prayer, we will not see the results we desire. God takes what we do and uses it in our kids to produce much fruit. What are some reasons why it's important to pray for our children? Because prayer protects our children and shields them from the constant attacks of the devil, the world and the flesh. Each day, our children are subjected to thousands of offensive images and words, as well as the amount of peer pressure to comply with everybody else. So without prayer, our children will not be able to stand against the things that they face from childhood until they leave this world. So we pray for their protection. God is the one who's able to protect their minds from the influence of these things. Prayer also helps us focus on what is the important things in our life for our children. Remember, they belong to the Lord, and as such, we well, should be seeking his input into their lives. Prayer leads to transformation in the lives of our children. We want them to come to know the Lord and so we prepare the way for them and we do everything we can. And nobody else knows our children as well as we do. And no one can pray for our children like we can. You know, when you look at your children, you know their strengths, you know their weaknesses, you know those little acts of defiance and their stubbornness and then those smiles that just brighten and uh, melt your heart away. But you're able to understand your children better than anybody else. Because they're like you. They've got part of your genes in you. And so you know them better than anybody else. And there's only one person that can love them more than you do, and that's God. But that's why we pray for our children. We have intimate knowledge about our children that others don't. The way that we interact with them, we see their strengths, their weaknesses, their joys, their struggles, and their future goals. We can pray for each child according to their <coughs> needs, their strengths and weaknesses. Others can pray as well. But you know, they can't pray as well as you and I can for our children because they're our children. God entrusted them into our care and no one else but you may be praying for your children. So if you don't pray for them, who else will? Prayer brings us closer to God. It changes our life. And we become better because of it. And because of that, we'll have a more direct impact in the lives of our family. But by praying, it changes us. And when we change, it affects those around us. Now, praying for our children, it's not easy. It takes work, it takes effort. Often, it takes blood, sweat and tears. But hey, that's what we're doing for all eternity. Their lives matter. And just like Hannah, we need to be prayer warriors. Take them constantly before the throne of God. We don't always have the answers. We don't always have an owner's manual. But we do have the one who knows us and knows them. And he wants to be in the lives of the children that he's gifted us with. And he wants us to be able to trust him with them. As we celebrate Mother's Day today, we give thanks to God for you, for your children. And as a parent and a grandparent, we all have the ability and the power to bring them before the throne of God every day. That's something that we can do. I had someone come last night because problems in the family, particularly from uh, a spiritual attack perspective, and um, so we prayed 
and the person was wondering, well, what's this going to do? And I said, it will change you before it changes the other person you're praying for. And I gave this person some prayers that she could pray for the situation. And then because there was a little child that's involved as well that was being influenced, I said, start praying for him. And sometimes we think, well, what can I do? And I thought afterwards, one of the things that as mothers we can start to share with our little ones is teach them how to pray, but teach them the song, Jesus Loves Me. You know? Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. If you start them young, teaching them that, singing it to them, it then becomes something that provides them with security and they can call out to the Lord Jesus themselves because they have learned Jesus loves me because the Bible says so. And they have been learning this principle since they were very little. And so as mothers, I'd encourage you, start young and continue to teach them. We've been given this responsibility, and it's an awesome responsibility. But as mothers, don't estimate, underestimate the power and influence you have in your family. Don't underestimate the power of prayer. God answers prayer. He delights in prayer. And sometimes we can find ourselves too busy, but that's what God wants us to do, to bring ourselves before the throne of God and ask his help in situations 